I want to thank you for joining us today. We're going to continue our study of 2 Peter in the second chapter. Last week I ended it a little bit more abruptly, didn't realize how long I'd already gone on the first section, and so uh, there's just so much material in the second chapter, I didn't want to just rip through the last few verses, so, so we're going to divide that in half, as well as I had an extra class I needed to do. So i uh, going to be back on what was my original schedule of spending two weeks on this chapter. I thought I could get it done in one, uh, but just wouldn't have been conducive last week. So we're going to pick up our study in verse 12 of 2 Peter chapter 2 today. And uh, let's begin with a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Our Father in God, we bow in your presence. Um, we are sure thankful that you've given us your word. And uh, to know that it is so sure and steadfast. And Father, to remember as we read last week that you are able to save to the uttermost, utter, uttermost those who trust in you. Uh, you're able to deliver the righteous out of temptation, uh, that you are a God who is there for us. You are a God who cares about us. You are a God who loves us with a supreme love, uh, so much so that we just can't even begin to fathom or even thank you so much for what you've done. Father, we give you honor and praise. We know that you're the God who created this world the sun, the moon, the stars, everything that we see, even the things that we don't see. And to know that you're the creator, you are not just that, but you're the sustainer. You continue to keep it going and you provide because you are our savior. Thank you for your word. Please open our eyes today to see the wondrous things you have for us in store as we read it today in Jesus name and amen. All right, so last week we started out by looking in chapter 2, which was a complete contrast to the end of chapter 1. And we see the first word in chapter 2 is but, now in contrast to what he's just said, and remember the end of chapter 1 is the prophetic word that we have that's sure and steadfast. The word that came not by the will of man, not by the purpose of man, not by or through man, but holy prophets of God were, were moved to write the things that God has told us to write. No scripture ever came by the will of man. It came from God. So then the warning in chapter 2 is, but false teachers have gone out and they have corrupted the word. That they, through their own secret ways, their deceptive words, have led to destructive heresies, causing divisions in the church. And so the warning is over and over again, listen to the word of God, but compare that to anything that a, fall, a teacher would say. We need to know that today too, not just in Peter's day. If anyone teaches something, we need to first of all, open it and lay it alongside of the word of God. How do they compare? If there is a something that they're teaching that's not true, then we reject that teaching because the word of God came by the will of man. And then he gives us three examples. That's where we concluded with last week. He uses the example of the angels who sinned. And we talked a little bit about that, that quite possibly happened before creation ever occurred and that the Satan led a rebellion. Those angels who sinned were cast out of heaven and kept in, in chains of darkness, the scripture says. The second example that he used is of the days of Noah and all those unrepentant ones that Noah was preaching to that they wouldn't listen and that Noah was able to save his self, himself, his wife, his three sons and their three wives, a total of eight people. But God meted out judgment and punishment on all of those unrepentant ones in Noah's day. In fact, the scripture tells us that God even regretted that he had made the world and all of these people since they turned so far away that, only, that every thought of their heart was only evil continually. So God meets out judgment upon them. And the third example that he used was of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and how God rained down fire and brimstone and judgment on those ungodly, immoral cities. 
And he says that God knows how to punish the wicked. But as we learned, there was righteous Lot and God was able to preserve him. And verse 9 told us that God is able to save or deliver the godly out of temptation. And uh, so that's where we left off, knowing that what kind of character we're talking about, presumption and arrogance and haughtiness on the part of these false teachers, and God is going to bring a swift destruction upon them. So let's begin our reading today at verse 12. But, again, here's this contrast, but these, that is these false teachers, like natural brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. Now, he's going to begin to explain who they are. They are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes, verse 14, full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices, and they are accursed children. Verse 15, they have forsaken the right way and gone astray. Following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Wow. Wow. Look at the characteristics of these false teachers. It's not only that their teaching is false, the things that they're saying are false, but their life is false. You see, they're living a lie. These false teachers, they're not just somebody who is mistaken about something, that they got a detail wrong, that they're, that they're just mixed up on something. It's not that they just haven't studied something out well enough. These false teachers, they are false. Their lifestyle is false. The, the choices that they make, the way they live their life, they are false teachers. They, they're, they're themselves, they're false beyond even teaching false things. So let's break it down like Peter does and see if we can't understand a little bit more about who they are. They speak things that they do not understand, first of all. <clears throat> that is, they're, they're arrogant, they're haughty, they're self-righteous. They, they put on an air about them, and they talk about things they, they don't even understand. They don't even know what they're talking about. But, oh, how they sound. That they, that they speak in such a way that they, they, they teach things in such a way of their arrogance and their haughtiness shows that they don't even know what they're talking about. The second characteristic, he says, they are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions. That is, they're liars, they are deceivers, they are tricking or trying to deceive other people by the way they're living. They're like spots and blemishes. Luke, uh, Jude uses the, the term, they're like rocks in your love feast. So, so I want you to imagine that, that you go to a, a potluck, you go to somebody's home and they, they serve you a meal and it just looks wonderful and you, you, you take a spoonful or a forkful and you bite down and there's a rock in there. And he says, that's what they are. See, they're deceptive. You didn't see that rock. You didn't know it was there. They're spots and blemishes that they're carousing in their own deceptions. They're just living this wild life in their own lies and believing their own deceit and believing their own lies, just going along, living that kind of lifestyle. Thirdly, he says, they have eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. 
That is, they're immoral in their conduct. They, they just continually live this decadent, depraved lifestyle. They're just, they can't see, they can't stop sinning. Their eyes are full of adultery. Everything that they see, they take in and they want, even though it's not theirs, it doesn't belong to them. Their eyes are full of it. Verse, uh, the fourth thing, they entice unstable souls. You see, they're unscrupulous. Um, they come and they prey upon the weak or the feeble. They take advantage of those who, who maybe don't have all of their faculties or they, they haven't figured something out completely. They, they prey upon the weak and, and they try to isolate them because they are unscrupulous in the way that they do this. They, are, uh, they, they prey on the uninformed in that regard. Isn't that a sad picture? It, it's like what we hear today when you hear about elder abuse. When you hear about older people that somebody has taken advantage of, you know, there, there are elder attorneys who, who just work with the, the elderly because of the unscrupulous ways of people taking advantage, maybe somebody because they're more feeble at this point, maybe they're uninformed, maybe it is that, that they just, that they don't have all of their, their faculties about them, and somebody takes advantage of them and drains their bank account or Whatever the case is, it's just horrible to hear. That's what these false teachers are. They're, they're false people. They're unscrupulous in what they're doing. They, they entice unstable souls and take advantage of them. The fifth thing that he says is they have a heart that is trained in covetous practices. Now, that's really uh, picturesque. It's not just that, they, it's not just that they're covetous but they have a heart that has been trained in covetous practices. They know how to be covetous. They know how to take advantage of other people. They are so greedy in their ways. They're so eager for more that they'll take advantage of anyone at whatever cost. It doesn't make a difference because they're trained in this. They know what they're doing, these false teachers, in the way that they attack people. The sixth thing he says, they are accursed children. That is, or cursed children. They're going to receive the curse of God. They will be destroyed. They'll face the destruction for their lifestyle and the things that they've done. The next one, the seventh thing, they have forsaken the right way and gone astray. And he uses the example of Balaam. And that's an Old Testament example that talked about a false prophet who just wanted really the money he wanted. He was so greedy that he tried again and again and again to fight against God and to fight against those who were there that day. And he says, they've forsaken the right way. They've just turned their back. They, they know what's right. You see, that's what makes this so pernicious. That's why these false teachers are so wrong and bad in what they're doing. It's not that they're just mistaken that they didn't understand something, that they've gone down a wrong path, but they've chosen a wrong way. They've left the right way, chosen the wrong way, and gone astray now to lead other people down that path. And he says finally that they are wells without water, clouds carried about by a tempest for whom the blackness of darkness is reserved. They're clouds without water. What, what a great, great example or illustration that he uses here, especially of those who would be farmers and understand the importance. Oh, here comes a cloud, here comes some rain, but the cloud just blows on by. These false teachers, they promise a lot. They come in like they're going to bring something that's good, but yet they just blow right on by, like a, a, a cloud carried about by a tempest. It didn't, it didn't help. There was no rainfall. It didn't bring any kind of help to this. But this is the miserable and true picture of a false teacher. As many today, um, they might look nice on the outside. Might be all dressed up, have a flashy smile, perfect hair, perfect teeth. And, and they know exactly how to, how to talk and how to persuade and how to lead people. 
But the problem is they've been trained in the ways of covetousness. They understand what they're doing. They, they're just looking for the next dollar. They're looking for the next person they can do, the, the one they can walk away and say, uh, you know, I got another one. I, I've got more, I've got another follower, I've got more money, I've got whatever that comes to me and more power, more authority. He says, uh, they've just forsaken the word of God. They've turned away from it. So you see that, the, again, the encouragement and the admonition for us is to grow from chapter one so that we can be aware of what that teaching is, what's true and what's false. Now, if you have a group that you're sitting with, I want you to stop the video for just a minute or two. I want you to talk about, not, not by name, you don't need to isolate people, uh, but I want you to talk about those that maybe you've seen who have been false teachers like this, of, of how that occurred, of how sad it is and what you've seen maybe occur in the lives of some people. Take a couple of minutes to think about that, talk about it if there's a group of you together, and then we'll come back and we will finish up the second chapter in just a few minutes. All right, so did you spend a little time thinking about these things, give it some consideration, and uh, talk about how they are so successful? How false teachers, even though they may look nice, are really uh, like what the Lord talked about uh, when he says that outwardly they whitewash the, the tombs, but inside they were full of dead men's bones, um, all kind of corruption. These false teachers, you see, they look good, they even sound good sometimes, but what you and I need to be aware of and what these first century Christians that Peter's writing to needed to be aware of is what the Word of God actually teaches. To know that no scripture ever came by the will or by the purpose or by the designs of men, but holy men of God were born along, were moved to write the scriptures. And so we need to go back to that and be aware of what the Bible teaches. All right, let's finish up the second chapter. We'll begin reading at verse 18 and uh, follow along with us now. It says, for when they speak, that is these false teachers, when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption, for by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. Okay, so verses 18 and 19. You see, when the teacher, when this false teacher comes along, he speaks great swelling words. The, the, I mean, he sounds so good. He's got such a smooth approach. He's got such a beautiful voice. He looks so nice so that when he speaks, he speaks great swelling words. But again, what does he say? They're words of emptiness. It's like what we just read in the verse before about a cloud that comes and here it comes our way and it's going to finally give some water to the earth so it waters our crops and vegetables. But a tempest, a wind just blows it right on by. They, they promise great things. They speak great swelling words, but there's nothing to them. It's emptiness. There, there's nothing of any lasting spiritual value that gives us something to hold on to and hang on to. In fact, he says they allure them through the lust of the flesh. What they really do is now they turn from the word of God to the base things of this world and they actually entice and allure and deceive people into sinning, the fulfilling the lust of the flesh and lewdness. He said the ones who have escaped that very thing already in their life. See how sad this is? See, a false teacher comes along and a false teacher brings somebody, dupes somebody into believing something that's not true by enticing them and say, oh, well, well, you can do this even though the word of God says contrary and appeals to the lust of the flesh. And so this person now, that they go headlong into this, into the very things that they had escaped before the very thing they had actually been taken out of 
to begin with. Isn't it sad to see this picture? We've seen it happen. You've seen it. I've seen it happen before. Somebody becomes a Christian. Oh, they, they're so excited. They're so elated. And, and they, they leave their old lifestyle. Maybe it was alcohol. Maybe it was drugs. Maybe it was immorality. They leave that behind. Oh, they, they've escaped all of that. And they start living their life, start doing the things that God wants them to do. And through whatever means, somebody or something entices them back into the ways of the world from where they were before. And he says, that's what happened. They escaped the very things that they lived. They promised them liberty, but really what they delivered them is corruption. And the person is overcome and he's brought back into bondage. How sad it is to see somebody leave the lifestyle of alcohol or drugs or pornography and they, they've escaped from that and then they turn and they go right back into it again and the bondage that they feel and how they're now it just seems like overwhelmed and held and and encompassed by this new or this the, the not new but this same sin all over again and it becomes worse for them he goes on to say verse 24 if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. That's what we're saying. It's like the person who falls off and goes even deeper than it was before. You may have been with us. Uh, it's probably been about a year or so that Daryl Townsend came and, and spoke to us and and he told the heartbreaking story about one of the men that he had worked with for years. Uh, the man had been out of prison now. He, he had left his whole lifestyle behind. All of the problems that were there, he was on a great path and a great pattern. But he had to go back to his hometown because he had to take care of some legal issues down there. He goes and he just happened to see somebody at the bank where he was a guy that he used to hang with. And this guy invites him to come back to this old way of lifestyle and the drugs that they were involved in. And he said, no, uh, no, he wasn't going to do that. He changed his life. He was living a new path. He got in his car and he began to drive away and he hadn't gone very far at all. And he turned and he went back and he spent the week with this guy and he drained his entire savings account of every dollar that he had he was arrested again and was back incarcerated. That's exactly what Peter's talking about here. Here is somebody who escapes the sin of their life and then a false teacher grabs them and deludes them and, and entices them to follow back in, and they fall in and it's worse than it was to begin with. He says in verse 21, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb. A dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to wallowing in the mire. Sadly, the picture has happened over and over again. A false teacher comes in deludes somebody, entices somebody, tricks them, deceives them into believing this is the right way. This is a good way. You don't have to worry about what God has said. You can live the life the way you want to live. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to, whatever it is, and teaches them, and they fall off of the path. And it's the ugly picture, the disgusting picture of a dog returning to eat his own vomit and a sow, a pig that's washed all up for show and runs right back into the mud and muck in front of them. That's the picture that we see, and it's happened sadly over and over again. Their life gets cleaned up, our life gets cleaned up, and then bam, we just turn and we go right back into the old way. Peter's admonition, Peter's warning, Peter's encouragement is for us to grow in chapter one, grow in our faith, grow in our knowledge of the word of God, because here in chapter two, false teachers will come along and we need to be able to be aware of them, identify them, 
and be able to turn away from them so they don't destroy our soul. So we don't lose our soul in the midst of this. That's my encouragement to you. Open up the Word of God. Read it. See what it says. If I'm teaching or Wayne's teaching or Jared's teaching or whoever it is standing in front of you, whether it's on a video or you're in a class or you're sitting around a table and somebody tells you something, compare it to the Word of God and see what God has said and stick with what God has said knowing that's where the reward's going to be. All right, next week we will finish the book of 2 Peter. We're going to look at the third chapter. I hope you'll join us for that as we continue this study and gain from its teaching.